When I was 24, I adopted two delightful little boys, and it was the, it was the, the, the best decision that I ever made. And uh, it, was, it was a growing process for me. When, uh, when Wally turned uh, seven, two years after I adopted them, I got a call from the school. It was a bump in the road. He was going to fail second grade. I had no idea what to do in, in a situation like this. I started thinking through my own experiences, and I, I, I had an incredibly bad memory. It just I, I just have a very poor natural memory. And, but one, one of the things, I had, a, I had a breakthrough, and I realized that I learned best by understanding why things worked and why. So I got the idea of teaching Wally just that. And I'm a science guy, so I thought, I'm going to teach Wally the just all kinds of things about science and how things work and why. So I started on this little by little and day by day. Six months later, I got a call from the school, and they told me something astonishing. They said Wally was assessed with an IQ of 145, and that he and his little brother, Jerry, were both admitted into the Advanced Gate program of the school. And I just went, touchdown, and then, but what happened? <laughs> and I realized Jerry was tailgating the whole time, and that's why he got in, but I didn't know what I did. As I watched him over the next couple months, I went, I started to figure it out. I went, they've become little thinkers, <laughs> you know, little analyzers instead of just little memorizers. And this began a journey for me of understanding how kids can be powerfully affected by deep science. Now, to start, I have to define science. Science is not what's in the textbook. It, science is what is. It's, it's like everything that is. That's science. Let me give you an illustration. Have you ever been out and just on a summer day and you've been sitting around and you've seen a bush with a bunch of flowers on it? And you suddenly, I mean, not suddenly, but there's a lot of bees working in that particular bush. Have you ever noticed that they're just a little distance away from the flowers and they kind of flit around totally randomly and then they land and then they get up and do it all over again? Well, no one on earth knew why they did that. And when scientists figured it out, they were totally astonished. They're reading the electrical fields of the flowers. What? <laughs> why? What's going on? Well, what happens is everything anchored to the earth has a slight negative charge because of lightning strikes and other things. It travels up into the buildings, up into the plants, and up even into the flowers. And the bees, when they're flying through the air, they have a slight negative. They have a, they're shedding electrons, so they have a slight positive charge. Positive B on negative flower changes the charge of the flower. They'll drink for a little bit, then they'll take off, and that's now a positive flower. And what it takes about 20 minutes for the flower to change back to its original charge. And in that same time, the plant's been able to refill it with nectar. So what they're looking for is flowers that have been refilled. And they can tell by their electrical fields. Isn't that incredible? <sighs> So this is an example of what is. And when you get it to merge with what can be, it becomes really powerful. I love science. Can you tell? <laughs> okay. Have you ever given your dog one of those bones, like a ham shank? It's got the big, white, thick bone on it, and they gnaw at it, gnaw at it, gnaw at it, and, it, and not, the word is gnaw at it. And, they, and it doesn't go away. It's still there. That's, that's compact bone or cortical bone. Inside a rice grain-sized volume of it, there's a million tunnels that grow into place. And what is happening is there's, when the bones are alive, there's a moving stream going through those tunnels. I heard this and I went, what is going on? And when I learned, I was shocked. There's millions of cells that are buried in your bones alive. They're bone prisoners. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> and they're being fed by the supply stream of oxygen and food through that stream that's, throwing th that's flowing through the bones. And when I heard this, I went, what is going on? They're reading the electrical fields of the stressing of your bones, and they're also reading the fluid pressures within those tunnels to determine where the microfractures are to fix them because they coordinate an orchestra and the fluid pressures as well to detect where the, where the bones need to be strengthened. Without those living prisoners inside your bones, nothing with bones could live. That's the only thing that's keeping you alive. And those, the scientists studying that have developed a microfiber cloth and you can put it on bones. They're experimenting with animals. They'll put it on bones uh, that, that need to be healed, and it's speeding up the healing speed of the bones. So this is an example of what is merging with what can be. 
And to me, it's incredibly exciting. Now, I want to tell you about two kids that are so beloved to me. And the effect science had on them and the science didn't have on them. Okay? I walked into my first science classroom as a teacher. I was really nervous. I stood behind the desk and I remembered what happened right on the other side of my desk. The week before, there was an attempted murder. And the police came, the ambulances came. When everything was cleaned up and everything taken away, the teacher threw up his hands. He said, I'm out of here. And he took off and I was hired to take his place. <laughs> I go, whoa, in my first class. <laughs> Tough class. So well, I started trying to teach them, and they were not interested at all, especially what the school was telling me to teach them. And uh, so I, I just kind of abandoned ship on all, all status quo on how to teach, and I just speak the typewriter approach is what I, I invented this myself, the term. <laughs> and all I did was I walked back and forth, and I told them wonder after wonder, exciting thing after that the things that motivated me in science. And I was amazed at how they responded. And I did this week after week, and we had so much fun. They became so beloved to me, and I learned they were smarter than I was. It was really fun. And then I'll never forget the day when Sam, one of the big burly gang leaders, came up to me. And he had this little teeny flower, and he's like about jumping out of his shoes, and he's going, look at this flower, Mr. Miller. Look at this thing. And he's pointing out all these things, and there's not a peep out of the kids in the back because they knew he'd cream them if there was. <laughs> and he's, he's all excited. And I'm sitting back, and I'm just, I'm loving it. I'm going, this guy's life has been changed. It's transformed. There's a fire that started burning inside those kids. And an incredible fire began to burn inside me. I realized if kids can know the truth about what's going on, the truth about the world, they can be profoundly transformed. Debbie's situation, Debbie was a delightful 17-year-old, straight A's across the board. You know, just a brilliant girl. We sat down, I'd known her for a long time. We started chatting. She said, yeah, I took this AP Chem class six months ago. And she said, I hated that class. I said, I understand. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then as I kind of asked her some questions, I realized she's already lost 70% of what she stuck in her head in order to pass those classes. And then, and then I said, she's going to lose 90% by the time she graduates. You know, like, what's the point of this? And, and then what really bugged me was I realized she didn't have any sense of wonder in the world around her. Like, nothing. Ten years of acing our science, no wonder at all. And I just was really mad, actually. And I, I got, I, I, I was, something's really wrong. Something's really wrong. Then I checked it out. There are some things that are really wrong. The United States is scoring consistently at the bottom of, of international testing, uh, science testing of the heavily industrialized nations. <gasps> Slow down. <laughs> Ten for only 10% of our workforce is involved in science. There's more jobs. There's more good jobs. We have to get them from outside because people aren't able to handle the jobs. STEM students are the, like the kids who just go, yes, when it comes to science in their school years. 50 to 70% are dropping out in their college years. What, what is going on? There's, a, there's, there's, there's just a real problem here. But that's not even the tip of the iceberg. If you ask the average high school kid here in Temecula, and you ask them, you, 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 you just say, Hey, kid, I, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I got a question for you. Tell me everything you know about your lungs. Or tell me about the electrons. You'll be amazed at how much of them have nothing to say. <laughs> That'd be great in a lot of situations. <laughs> but it's not in this one. There's nothing up there. It's like a vacuum. There's big changes coming. In the next 10 years, 10 million jobs are going to go from labor intensive up to high cognitive. That translates as a lot of hurting families. If we can make our science incredible, we can give those kids a, a start. We can give them an opportunity to make those kind of trans, transitions. <coughs> Excuse me. So the cause, what's the cause of this? What's the cause of this problem? Cause is something we all know about. Science is compartmentalized. In middle school, we do life, earth, and physical science. In high school, we do biology, chemistry, and physics. This leads to a massive drop of material out of kids' brains. Huge amount of science knowledge completely drops out, like I'm talking to about you about, about Debbie. Um, it, it leads to the vacuum. It leads to the airspace between, <laughs> between their ears. And it's, 
it, 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 a mile wide and an inch deep cannot stand the fire of time. It will drop no matter what you do. It's going to fall. But it's even more than that. The compartmentalization of science, what it does is it makes all science dead and lifeless. And what it does, and if you're a science student, you know exactly what I'm saying. It puts a cage around you. And the teachers bless their hearts. They cannot go outside of that cage and grab the fantastic and the fascinating and the wonderful. And it's those very things that give the power to deep science. It's those very things that make it so life-transforming for kids. Is there an answer to all this? Uh, there is. <laughs> you know, like, let the choir begin. There is. It's reorganizing all of science into global topics. That's our word for it, global topics. Basically, there are things that thread through the sciences. They merge the sciences. Now, now I want to have fun with you. I'm getting to see your faces. It's so cool. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is, deep, when, I, when I say a science mind or I say deep science, I'm talking about what actually goes on inside of the minds of the scientists who are making all the discoveries. The guys who know what they're talking about. And you can put that into kids if you use ingenious techniques. Okay. So what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say, what you going to do? And you're going to go, go deep. You ready? Okay. It's audience participation, okay? <laughs> okay. What you gonna do? Go deep. A little bit louder. What you gonna do? Go deep. Okay, good. So what we're gonna do is this is a pot. This is my Mr. Miller's pot, okay? <laughs> this is gonna be our global topic pot. And this is gonna be the global topic pot of electricity. So I'm gonna put it right down here, okay? So this is gonna be Bill Nice out. This is gonna be the big pot of electricity. Okay, inside my big pot is everything about electricity. It's a little bit boring, but it, it'll work, okay? So we got it there. So what are we going to throw into it to make ourselves a science stew for you? <laughs> Sorry, it came to me when I was preparing today. <laughs> so we got to put bones in there, right? So we'll put bones in there. So now we've got transistors, transformers, and trabiculi. Those are the spongy bone. All in the same class. Oh, no, it's cool. <laughs> it keeps our little brains going. Variety helps. Okay. So what else can we put in? Bees. Let's go for bees. We know they're involved with electricity. So what you going to do? Go oh, that was weak. What you going to do? Go Good. Okay. So we're going to put bees. There are all kinds of great things about bees. There's lots, lots of things there. Now, solar electricity is a necessity. Okay, but it's really boring. Boring, okay? So we got to do something with it. What you going to do? Go Good, we're going to put it, it up there. <laughs> Solar electricity on the space station. That's hot stuff. It's cold stuff, actually. It's <laughs> minus 450 degrees, and it's, you got this solar wind radiation coming from the sun, blowing everything to bits. Poor NASA's going, what are we going to do? And <laughs> what kind of chemical innovations? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what I say? No. <laughs> You guys got me. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't in the script. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And we got the engineering innovations. And we got the physics innovations. And that's why it works. Okay. What else can we do? We got to go to the greats, Tesla, Edison, um, Faraday. And what you going to do? Okay. So, we, you know, these guys are so good. You don't want to sprinkle little bits and you want to go jump in the pool with them. Uh, this is... More, this is um, Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower, it's 180 feet tall. It's insane. It's supposed to broadcast electricity around the world. Complete bomb did not work. Why? Tesla was super smart, like crazy smart. What went wrong? Go deep, right? And over here, we can do it a little bit. Why? Go deep. <sighs> I'm supposed to do this. Too full. <laughs> Jump in the pool. <laughs> Whoa, my time. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so you got these, you got these global pots, you got them all over the place. In different, in different global topic areas. And what you do is all the time you just go into them, 
Keep going deep, reviewing the great stuff, having a blast reviewing. You know how dull reviewing is? This is cool reviewing. And then you, you have, you, anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> this is really good for, if you know of challenge-based learning, it's really, really good for that because the kids are deep in so many different areas and most real science solutions happen because they go outside of the box. So our kids will be trained to go outside the box, okay? So what we've been doing is we're going, we're merging the sciences and then we're going deep. What this does is it, it, it makes kids thinkers and analyzers like Wally and Jerry instead of just memorizers. It gets, we have kids have real science minds. It's really fun to have a science mind. Another thing is, is it prepares kids for job transitions that they're gonna encounter later in life. Because you know, things change in society, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then it strengthens for college. You know, you got the, the light backbone in there, inside there, and, and it's like when you have a really boring professor, just like, ah, I can't stand this, you, you have the light that you know I can still press on because I know what's at the end of the tunnel. It really helps with that a lot. And for me, <laughs> for me, it gives kids the eyes to see the wonders around them. It's so incredible, it's such an incredible gift to have that um, for, for kids for a lifetime. Okay, Apple was failing, and then Apple rose to be the most powerful corporation in the world. It didn't happen because they copied anybody else. They dared to be wildly creative. They dared to do it different, is the way they said it, than everybody else. Our science will never reach its potential as long as we're trying to copy the world. We have to be radically different. Why can't we be the most merged science country in the world? Why can't we fight to delight in our science classes like no other have ever tried to do? Why can't we delight the kids? The teachers are getting killed. Uh, they're, um, they're, they're just, it's hurting, it's hard. Why can't we delight the teachers? And why can't we delight the parents? And you go, oh, delight the parents? How does that figure in? With the kids coming home going, mom, dad, look at this. And they're so excited. We have the opportunity to launch the kids and the parents on a journey that will be absolutely unforgettable. We can help bond so many beautiful ways. Now, people know what I'm saying is true. They know it. They know it themselves. But the thing is, when are we going to get courage to do it? That's the thing. And I'm thinking of the little Wallys and Jerry's. I'm thinking of the beloved Sam's that have never had the chance. When you're in the class with them, it touches your heart in a powerful way. I'm thinking of the delightful Debbies. I'm totally in. How about you? Thanks.